What's up, and welcome to chapter 32 of Traditions and Encounters, Societies at Crossroads. During this time, the Ottoman Empire, Russia, China, and Japan faced common problems. These included military weakness, they were vulnerable to foreign threats and outside invaders coming in and toppling their empires, and also internal weaknesses. These included economic problems, financial difficulties, and corruption by high officials. There were reform efforts in these places to try to fix these problems. They primarily targeted political and educational reform and also wanted industrialization, following the Western models from Western Europe and the United States. There were different results of these reform efforts, however. So in the Ottoman Empire, Russia, and China, they were unsuccessful, and these societies almost collapsed. However, Japan was more successful, and they eventually emerged to become an industrial power in Asia. The Ottomans declined due to their military failing. Their military declined because the forces were really behind European armies in terms of strategy, tactics, weaponry, and training. So basically everything. Their Janissary corps were politically corrupt and undisciplined, and this didn't contribute to their ability to defend themselves against outsiders. Provincial governors, who were rulers of certain areas of this empire, also gained power, and their private armies took control over the Janissaries. As a result, the Ottomans lost much territory across Central Asia and Egypt. Economic difficulties were also critical. There was less trade through the empire as Europeans shifted their trade away from this area to the Atlantic Ocean Basin and the Americas. The Ottomans also exported raw materials and imported European manufactured goods, so their resources were leaving them, as was their money supply. Capitulations was the European domination of the Ottoman economy, and they used a term called extraterritoriality. This meant that they were exempt from Ottoman law within the empire and could operate tax-free and levy their own duties in Ottoman ports. This enabled Europeans to collect all the revenue from trade, and instead of this money going to the government, it went to European companies instead. This deprived the empire of desperately needed income, and as a result, the Ottomans were becoming more poor. A reformer named Mahmud II became the sultan, which is the leader of the Ottomans, after a revolt. The Janissaries resisted his rule, and so he had them killed. And as a result, he built a European-style army, academy, schools, roads, and telegraphs to build up the infrastructure of the Ottoman Empire. He also organized legal and educational reforms called the Tanzimat. This was the reorganization era. The ruling class brought sweeping reforms to the state, also legal reforms to the people, and education for young people. This undermined the authority of the religious body, but enhanced the state's authority to control everyone. Religious conservatives were against this new rule because they didn't like the attack on Islamic law and tradition, the secularization of the Ottoman Empire. And young Ottomans wanted even more reform than the Tanzimat. They wanted more freedoms, autonomy, and decentralization. The Young Turk era followed. These were cycles of reform and repression. These young Turks took over the bureaucrats and they demanded a constitutional government. They were also able to reform the army and administration away from these Tanzimat reforms. The Young Turks eventually became a dominant force in the Ottoman Empire. They called for universal suffrage, equality, freedom, secularization, and women's rights. So wanting the Ottomans to become more liberal and more like Western Europe. They were also nationalistic. They wanted Turkish dominance over the small Arab minority in this time. And eventually the empire only survived because of distrust among European powers and European powers not being able to come together to defeat these Ottomans. The Russian Empire came under pressure from military defeats and social reforms. The Crimean War was a war in which Russia expanded from Manchuria, which is northern Korea-ish, across Asia to the Baltic Sea, which is around the Ottoman Empire. And they also wanted to get to the Mediterranean Sea, which was controlled by the Ottomans as well at this time, to have better access to trade. The Europeans supported the Ottomans against Russia because they didn't want Russia to grow too big. And this defeat forced the Tsars to modernize the army and industrialize to be able to counter these Ottoman and European forces. In 1861, the Tsar Alexander II emancipated the serfs. So serfdom 
lot previously did not allow people to own land, but now people were allowed to own land and were able to develop Russia more economically. Serfs gained the right to land, but they didn't have political rights and still had to pay a tax. Emancipation, unfortunately, did not increase agricultural production for Russia as a whole. Political and legal reforms followed, but a weak system where nobles dominated and the Tsar held veto power was still in place. Legal reform was more successful. Juries, independent judges, professional attorneys all helped the legal system in Russia become more fair. Industrialization was big primarily with the railway and the Trans-Siberian Railway linking both ends of Russia. This suddenly allowed Russia to gain new trade and to transport things faster from one end of their country to the other. A state bank also helped to control the economy and industrialization in industries such as steel, coal, and oil grew. However, it fell hard on the working classes, kind of like what happened in America. The government didn't like the unions and strikes, and workers really wanted strikes so they could have more rights and better pay. The business class supported the autocracy and did not want reform for these working class people. Cycles of protests and repression followed. The peasants were still landless and they didn't have political power and they didn't like this quote unquote reform. Russification was also huge. It sparked ethnic nationalism and attacks on Jews. Anti-Semitism followed. Russians had extreme nationalism and wanting to be Russian. Terrorism was a tool of opposition, so Alexander II was assassinated by a bomb, and his successor and the Russian successors that followed were more oppressive and more conservative, going back to the old times of Russia. To cap this all off, a Russo-Japanese war in 1904-1905 ended with Russian expansion to East Lands, although Japan conflicted with this and tried to push them back. A revolution in 1905 led to a Russian defeat by Japan, and peasants through this revolt were able to seize landlords' properties and the workers formed into the Soviets, who eventually would come into power later. China had troubles with an opium war and unequal treaties during this time. The Qing dynasty was the main force that ruled China during this time. They had a system that restricted foreign merchants to one port city. And China had a lot of trade and many products to offer, but they didn't really want or care for European products. The East India Company, however, which was actually owned by Britain, cultivated opium. Opium is also the base plant of like heroin and other painkillers these days in exchange for Chinese goods. And suddenly the Chinese were hooked on opium and these painkiller drugs. The opium war followed. A commissioner in China wanted to stop the opium trade because he saw the devastating effects opium had on the people in China. The British refused, and so, kind of like the Boston Tea Party, he destroyed many thousands of chests, and the British didn't like this, and easily crushed the Chinese forces, and destroyed the Grand Canal for trade, because the Chinese did not have a strong army to defend themselves at the time. Unequal treaties followed. They were called unequal treaties because they were trade concessions made by the Qing dynasty. The Qing dynasty gave a bunch more power to the British and other European countries. In a treaty of Nanjing, Britain gained the right to continue the opium trade and also new ports such as Hong Kong. And they were also exempt from Chinese laws, kind of like extraterritoriality in the Ottoman empires. Unequal treaties applied to Western countries and Japan, these countries were able to have more power in China. China had lost most of their economy and many ports as well. To counter all this Westernization, the Taiping Rebellion occurred. This was an internal turmoil in China event in the late 19th century. The population was growing, but resources were not. And among other problems, officials were corrupted and drug addiction from opium was continuing to be a big problem in China. Major rebellions tried to overtake the weak government and also kick the Westerners out. The Great Peace, the Taiping program proposed by this person, called for an end of the Qing Dynasty because they didn't like the Manchus. The Qing Dynasty, as mentioned, were actually Manchurians who had 
came in and taken over the Ming Dynasty that came before. They wanted big social change. They didn't want private property foot binding or concubinage, which was very prevalent in China at the time. And it was a very popular movement that eventually moved on to the capital, Beijing. But eventually, they were defeated by the Qing and foreign troops who wanted to keep these rebels in check and keep the Qing dynasty in power because it was favorable to the Westerners. And so armies with European weapons were able to defeat these Chinese. The reform wasn't successful, but a self-strengthening movement followed to try to keep cultural traditions alive, even with European industrial technology coming in to China at the time. And a powerful empress actually opposed these changes, but was not successful. Eventually, these European countries and Japan came to form spheres of influences, which eroded Chinese power. Basically, foreign countries that took much control of China's political and economic sphere. They carved China into these spheres of economic influence, and each had different control of a certain province in China. The Boxer Rebellion capped all this stuff off. It was organized by the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists. They were known as the Boxers. And this local militia attacked foreigners and Chinese Christians as another attempt to kick these Westerners out. However, Europeans and Japanese troops came in and crushed these Chinese. And eventually, the Qing Dynasty collapsed as a result of this rebellion. Finally, there was the transformation of Japan. Japan was the only one of these few empires that was able to successfully industrialize and have more power in this changing world. They shifted from the Tokugawa dynasty to the Meiji, and they faced some early crises in reform. For example, crop failures, high taxes, and rising rice prices led to protests and rebellion. But eventually, they were able to quell these rebellions. Foreign pressure for Japan to reverse a long-standing closed-door policy also made them more open to trade. Japan wasn't isolationist anymore. They were finally p- participating in the worldwide trade. Many Western countries and even America forced them to do this. For example, the U.S. Commodore Perry sailed the U.S. naval fleet to Tokyo Bay and demanded entry and new trade rules. Japan was forced to accept unequal treaties, much like China and other Western countries. But at least from gaining these new trades, they could gain more money as well. The Tokugawa rule ended soon after, and widespread opposition to the shogun rule, which was the leader, especially in provinces, contributed to Japan opening up severely. The Meiji Restoration followed in 1868. Tokugawa armies were defeated by the dissident militia, and a boy emperor the Meiji regained authority of Japan, and this ended many centuries of military rule in Japan and changed it to an emperor. This new government instituted reforms. It welcomed foreign expertise, so the Westerners to come in and share their knowledge of industrialization and the Enlightenment. And it also helped the Japanese to build a new constitutional government modeled after these Western democracies. The feudal order was demolished, the daimyo and samurai from the Tokugawa lost status and privileges, and districts broke up old big tracts of feudal lands and spread this wealth out a bit more evenly. Samurai lost power significantly as a result of this shift away from the military government as well. A new tax system helped Japan become more economically stable, and the emperor remained supreme throughout all this time. A legislature as part of the constitutional democracy was created. It was called the Diet, and it was an opportunity for debate and dissent, which was really rare in East Asia during this time. The economy was able to successfully industrialize. Transportation, such as railroads, telegraph, and steamships improved, as did education and competitive universities and industry, both a combination of private and government controlled industries helped to grow Japan's economy. However, there were still many peasants in Japan and peasant uprisings did come up sometimes, but they were quickly crushed and little was done to alleviate the suffering of many of these people.
Lamb was often expensive, and labor movements were also crushed. Meiji law did not like these unions, and they thought these strikes were criminal. Eventually, as a result of all these pro-industrial and business reforms, Japan did become an industrial power in basically a single generation. It eventually was strong enough to end these unequal treaties and soon rose as a big power in East Asia, defeating China and even Russia. So in conclusion, this has been chapter 32 of Traditions and Encounters, Societies at Crossroads. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one.